the nest, I'm afraid. I brought you under false point pretenses. No illustrations, <laughs> just graphs, figures, and a celebrity photograph, that's all, I'm afraid. I was driving here today, and I heard on the radio that uh, the BMA forecasts that up to a third of all GPs were going to be retiring in the next five years, which uh, is quite worrying, particularly if you're going to get a sore throat in the next five years. But it's occurred to me, what does that mean? Because unless you know how many uh, archaeologists, how many GPs there are in the country, how many people are coming in, the retention rates, it doesn't actually mean a lot, does it? But it's a great headline. And in a sense, as I was driving down, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll rest, <laughs> blow the text, I'll start my talk with that instead. <laughs> um, because in a sense, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about not so much the images, but the people who create the images and how they're developing. And that's my interest. It was in, um, as Steve said, we, uh, I was involved in a, the Visualisation and Archaeology Project, three-year, uh, four-year project, funded by English Heritage, as they were. And um, it finished some time ago. Part of that, uh, there was various elements to the project. Part of it was a survey we undertook of archaeological illustrators, employed archaeological illustrators in England. I mean, a confined area, it's manageable and funding and everything like that. And in a sense, um, uh, I mentioned that not because I think you should be impressed, but because I'm going to reference it uh, in a minute. So, um, what, I, what I'm aiming towards here is to question um, the, the use of um, survey in archaeology and also to highlight some of the things that a specialist focus surveys can achieve. And I'll go through that in a minute. So I rather like this quote from Deborah Ball at King's College, because I haven't really thought about it. But she's talking about policymakers, and she says it's likely to be influenced by personal experiences by evidence. That's policy making and the way you experience it. And I thought it's just right, actually. Because as Steve said, I was at the uh, IFA conference, 2012 in Oxford, and I was given the results of the survey that we'd undertaken, a sort of brief overview of them. And a senior EH member of staff in the uh, audience piped up that in his, he travelled around and the figures that I were given, given in 2012 that were collected in 2010 were irrelevant because in his personal experience the sector had crashed. The archaeological illustrators, graphics, image producers, graphic specialists rather than cab monkeys. Um, <laughs> Their numbers had drastically diminished in that period. Sorry, no, no. way. And, um, and that was uh, his experience. And in a sense, it supported two things. One was more personal experience. Part of uh, the surveys we were doing, we interviewed a lot of senior staff around, uh, senior graphic staff. And there was a sort of doom and gloom amongst them all about the profession going forward. I think because it didn't know where it was going. I think because it was technology led. And I think it was because the economic situation at the time, they didn't know who was going to survive. But there was, again, there, there was this sort of sense of foreboding on personal experience. So, and there was also evidence coming out on the two, so in 2013, uh, profile in the profession survey, which indicated there was a, a radical drop in staff employed in archaeology, 30% drop. Which, um, so all of this or evidence, personal experience was coming together. There was uh, a feeling of despondency within the sector. And I pick even that up now, alternatively, I pick up some um, evidence that uh, people are quite cheerful within the, uh, so it's a patchwork, it depends where you work and perhaps what you're doing. But I'll, perhaps I can come on to that a little later, if I don't talk too much and have to stick through stuff. So evidence and personal experience is really important, I think. And evidentially as well, we've had a whole flurry of surveys since the end of the last century, which sounds great, uh, <laughs> which is a few years ago. So um, we have PTP, 
profile in the profession, surveys, uh, 99, 2003, 2008, 2013. The SIG, Special Interest Group Survey 2008, was carried out amongst AAI and S staff uh, members, sorry, uh, um, and VIA, Visualization and RPRG, uh, carried out in 2010, the survey that I undertook. Uh, here, what I tried to do with the various surveys was try to extract how many specialist graphic staff were employed in 2000, uh, over that period in England. And the profile of the professions, um, I was able to do that, extract that information, same with the SIG. And we've got this sort of rising graph over the period of the, of the noughties. Is that right? Um, and, and in a sense, that may reflect the sort of golden age that some people refer to like this, the rising commercial archaeology from the early 90s, PPG 16, where there's a sort of like huge explosion of archaeological staff over that period until we get to 2008 and the global crash, which I think really bit around in archaeology, I may be wrong, around 2009-10. That's when it started hitting. Okay. So the survey I undertook was fortuitous. I think I caught a cusp before we tumbled. <laughs> um, and uh, so the flags, incidentally. So numerically, we've got an upward slope until we come down to 2013. And this is the, uh, the sort of evidential uh, uh, proof, perhaps, of the size of the sector and how much the um, um, uh, economic climate affected it, although I suggest that's rather dramatic. <laughs> rather dramatic. I don't think there were, I don't think there were nine illustrators operating in England at that time. However, it does emphasise <laughs> does emphasise um, uh, this dramatic fall. Um, the one thing I would say, when I've got these little flags at the bottom, is that um, the profile and profession surveys, and I couldn't extract the, uh, the illustration specialists just from England, so those numbers are UK-wide. So if I could have got in there and extracted the Scottish and Irish and uh, Welsh, and uh, they would have, those figures, I think, would have slumped slightly. Similarly, the SIG, I couldn't extract, I could extract the employed illustrators from the freelance illustrators, but not uh, from the Europe-wide element of the membership that was surveyed. So again, I think they would slump. But what I would say about the VIA was um, I invested a lot of time and effort to get an accurate picture, to get a benchmark of where, who was working in archaeology at the time and their circumstances, the circumstances of those illustrators. So I phoned close on 200 organisations in England and asked who employed specialist illustrators. Okay, so I think we've got a good baseline here for where, uh, where um, the, the specialist uh, sector was for graphic staff. But the point is, since, <laughs> since that, um, since the crash, is what's happened I mean, the, the crash started by around 2010. 2013 profile and profession survey into a huge decrease in staff on, in this, across the sector, across archaeology. Uh, indicated 30% reduction, and he still maintains that, I think, now with a paper he put out in 2015, the beginning of this year, uh, in Cultural Trends. He says that the numbers are still down. So. I mean, I look around, and that's what I'm chatting away. We've got optimism over here. We've got some degree of pessimism floating around here. Laura, I don't know where you are on the situation, where our numbers now are over the past five years compared to... On personal experience, mm. numbers the same, but working hours smaller. Right. That's interesting. Mm. Anyone else got a view on it? I mean... <laughs> 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 okay, so the, 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 where are we now is an important thing. I don't think the profile in the profession gives an answer to that. 
And that's one of the main problems I have with that survey in relation to specialists. So to recap here, just quickly, VIA survey in 2010 provided quite, a, I think, a reasonably accurate uh, baseline figure of people employed in England as specialist illustrators. Okay, I can defend 96, I think it might go up to about 105 at guesswork. For the, there was a couple of uh, graphic studios that didn't want to get involved in the survey, fine, that's not a problem. Uh, profile of the profession said nine. Well, I'm not sure what value that has to us. Last week, uh, and some of you know this, um, I carried out a repeat of the 2010 survey uh, England-wide. And um, again, I went through the exercise over the past five, six weeks of phoning around about 150 organisations in England, finding out who, have, who has now specialist uh, illustrators, graphic staff now, I guess, employed in their companies, in their organisations. It doesn't include freelancers. Sorry, Drew. You are so much more difficult to isolate out there. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, but you getting to you is really, really difficult. Um, so where was I? <laughs> yes. So um, uh, I repeated the exercise of a lot of phoning around, talking to people, and I came up with the, the figure which I can defend now, employed illustrators, which is counter to everything that we're told, what we're asked to believe through the profile in the profession. Now, again, that's the figure I can defend. It's conservative with a little c because we're in the election phase and my little England flag and the UK thing, whatever like that. So, and another thing that really surprised me was that in 2010, about 96, those 96 illustrators are made up of 69 full time, 27 part time, which is sort of, I don't know, two and a half to one ratio. Yeah, anyone good at maths? Better than me. Counterintuitive in, in the time of zero hour contracts. It's four to one ratio. Full time illustrators are more heavily employed and represented in that number, and to the expense of part, not to the expense, but part time illustrators have been much more reduced. Isn't that strange? Where does that happen? Why does that happen? I don't know, I've only just got the figures in. So, and I haven't been able to really look at them because the returns are still coming in. Incidentally, um, the, when, when I set the questionnaires and had them back in 2010, we had an 80% response rate, which I think is pretty good by any standards, and I hope the same, although I've only got about 60% and yet, that I said, they're still coming in. Um, and I, so I haven't bothered to crunch too many figures because I didn't want to be too, uh, didn't want to misrepresent what I said. But what does this mean? Well, I, as we're at the CIA, CIFA conference, I forgot for the C and then it messes me up because I'm remembering C and not the IFA, and we're in a gag session, I, I sort of apply it to that, what does it mean? So uh, what I did do with the replies, that, uh, the responses I've already collected, which at least 50 come up to 60%, I looked at professional affiliation. 2010 figures in red were frightening enough, I thought anyway, with professional specialist graphic staff choosing not to be a member of a professional representative body were almost 50%. And in 2015, it's grown to nearly 60. Those are people not wanting to be part of the wonderful march forward. Also, and this is a, you know, so I only got around 60% in, I've lumped GAG and AAI and S together because they're, they're representative of professional illustrators. They're in decline. The, men, the representation amongst professional illustrators has declined with the CIFA has climbed slightly. It'd be interesting to see when I've got all the returns and pick through it what's happening there. But I think it's a, it's a message for both the CIFA and for GAG that they ought to perhaps be looking at. Because at the moment, 
with the returns that I've had, there are nine uh, employed <coughs> specialist illustrators employed, uh, who are members of GAG in England. And there should be more. I'm sorry? But then nobody's admitting to it. <laughs> and I'd, I wonder why that is. Hmm? But no, the way, what I would say there was, back in 2010, nobody knew how many people were working in the industry, in, in the sector of specialist graphics. Yeah. Nobody knew. Say again, please. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that's something that the uh, survey, we'll look at in a minute, actually. But that's saying this, this latest survey would start tracking. Because I, with the first survey, just going off at a tangent slightly, I could track back through to the late 60s, people coming into the profession and their longevity and what they were doing and where they were going. It's a highly detailed survey at Kerry Day. But as I said, for specialists, I actually wonder, and not just graphics specialists, I actually wonder how useful profile and profession is. Who is it for? There's another constituency as well that I think uh, I saw in Steve's um, abstract for the session was about how surveyors and illustrators come together and you know what they were doing and so on and so forth. And then listen to some of our colleagues here today. Um, uh, I think underlines the fact that there's a whole load of people out there who are professionals that are producing images that just aren't catered for, uh, possibly by gag, um, but although I, I'm sure some of them are your members, and I wouldn't pick them up, but these are professional archaeologists, but who are non-specialist graphic designers. We all know, you know, sort of project managers perhaps, project officers, we all know in our organize, or your organisations, there are people outside the graphics environment who are producing images for publication. We all know that. In 2010, I started asking the question when I realised that. So I didn't pick all of them up, but I think I picked most of them up. I got a sense of what was happening. And I hate it when numbers are similar because it makes it seem as though I'm making it up. But I'm not. <laughs> I'm only making it up a bit. But, uh, but there were 41 organisations or graphics teams who had specialist uh, graphic staff, you know, 41 organisations. Strange but true, there were also a similar amount of organisations who, although not employing specialist graphic staff, nevertheless staff produced images for publication or for what grey literature publication, whatever. Can you see, is that light? In, is that too light? Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Um, and what I thought was interesting was to get a sense of numbers, because I only charted the organisations they were in. I looked at the, the organisations we have some data on, those employing specialist gra uh, graphics producers. 19 of those organisations had single members. You know, there was just one member of staff, you know, make, comprising the team, as I call it. But 20 of, 20 of those graphics teams were made up of multiple members, so two plus, okay? For the organisations that didn't employ specialist image, provide, uh, image makers, but nevertheless they produced images, 13 had single members, but 28 had multiple, multiple members of staff produced. So I suggest by that, the numbers are as great, if not possibly greater, than specialist illustrators, added to the fact that when I spoke to the graphics offices, they said, as you were all nodding earlier, that there were people within their organisations producing images. So you've got a whole raft of people that you can add to this. There's a huge amount of people out there. When you're thinking of standards, you were talking about in your introduction perhaps, and when we talked about it, that are out there that are producing images. And I mean, personally, I mean, the, the visualization in archaeology project, this project I'm doing, I'm very, uh, I see images essential to archaeology. They're not, you're not CAD monkeys, you're not, you're not illustrators, in my opinion, who do what archaeologists or the client tells you. 
I think you're an integral part of archaeology. Can I? And, and I'm quite serious about that. I mean, I, I think images are central to the way uh, archaeology develops. And I think what you guys do is incredibly important. And yet, the amount of people I speak to feel they are sidelined, that they are bolt-ons to the company, and that they're there to do the bidding of field stuff. But as I read in the latest edition of The Archaeologist, the, in the brave new world of the CIFA, all specialists are archaeologists. Well, that's nice. But there's a large group of you out there, and you're incredibly important. So that's a bit of a by the by. I thought it was important pulling that up as a saint. So, getting around to my the first thrust of really what I wanted to talk about, doing the same thing over and over again, was about, in a sense, I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to knock profiling professions, I think it's incredibly important, but I actually wonder, looking at it, what it means to you. And I actually wonder what it does. So recently there has been acknowledgement that archaeology is not a sort of task defined in the field, but a process combining different specialisms. Okay, so I would ask, what's the value of generalised organisation-centred surveys to specialists. Okay, so that's my first point. Doing things over and over again, repeating these large-scale, um, repeating these large-scale sector-wide surveys, and I don't see where they impact on you. Moving on, and I'll have to draw on 2010 here because, as I said, we uh, the way the the conference and the survey that I've carried out recently come together, I just can't get figures together. But I'm interested in a, a few things, and I want a, a few elements that, um, that the uh, survey calls out. They're, they're minor elef element, elephants, again. <laughs> they're small elephants, but minor details as well. Um, and, but I just want to bring them together at the end to give you an idea of the type of thing that we, the, the survey can bring to the table of specialists and particularly illustrators. So here is, on one day in April in 2010, I asked what all the illustrators did. And this is a, 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 a summary of it. So 2010, publication in grey literature was the, all the images were going, the vast majority of the images were going into grey literature or publication. Okay, so um, what we've got obviously is a, um, it's odd because we've got a digital environment, all working environments now are digital in, in graphics offices, in all offices, and yet we still use the traditional model, even though it might not be printed, but we still go through to the tra traditional model, so we're wedded to that. Digital dissemination was small, has doubled seemingly so far in the, in the last five years, um, possibly because all this sort of WISO, um, digital, uh, enhanced, uh, immersive, get inside of it and move around stuff is going out to production companies or to specialist freelancers. And I think that's a warning in itself because I think there's, uh, there's a huge amount to be said for developing skills within an organisation. How much longer have I got? Um, this is, you might find interesting, okay? So I've got a split here, the, the black and the grey. Are those um, illustrators producing digital images only? Okay, I, I split it into gender because I found it quite interesting. It's something I was chasing through and I couldn't be bothered to read you the graph in all honesty. <laughs> and, um, and in the red, those people who on that day were producing images traditionally. Okay, so you can see that A, it's very restricted numerically, but more importantly, it's shifted up towards the old fogies. You know, 40 plus. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the, how this question has been answered now and plotting the differences, because I actually wonder if these are shunting up. Yeah, so I don't know, personally, when I look at the um, presentations today, I don't know whether that's important. I asked Susan, who did the first presentation, 
how she felt about those moving that wonderful history she did of of and and moving and how at the end she said it was an end of an era because this guy was leaving the pen and ink guy was leaving and i just wondered how she felt about that and i think i can't speak for her, but the feeling i got was well that's just it you know we are being pulled along by technology and that's how it seems so i don't know whether this is important i think it's important to some people and it's not important to other people but i think it would be a good idea for the CIFA or GAG to have a position on it, personally. Because, and if you don't have a position on it, and you don't, if you do value it, then do something about it. If you think, well, actually the way it's moving, the commercial pressures, whatever, is something you can't do anything about, fine, as well. But you haven't got much time, that's what it seems to me, to make that decision. <coughs> next help oh yeah Oops. and uh, so uh, with this in mind I just thought I'd better give you an example of how perhaps all the sort of data that I'm getting and try and give a nice neat neat little example of what we can do um, and and hopefully towards this sort of idea of where skills are where people are in the industry where the skills are in the industry and the impact of perhaps de-skilling, I thought I'd put this together. So the black bars are the percentage of teams working traditionally in, in graphics teams. What I've split them into is small, medium, large companies, organizations. So a small company is up to 50 employees, medium 50 to 250, large 250 plus. I know that's the end of the day. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you can see some clear differences there, and perhaps we can just chat through that quickly in a moment. What I've also put in, because publication seems to be a predominant uh, 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 end point for the illustrations, I thought I'd bung uh, um, uh, publication in and split it with who was doing, what percentage of the work was represented by publication in small, medium and large companies. That's what that line graph. That's what that line graph is telling you. And then I thought I'd put in a filter of outsourced work. So who was outsourcing work? What percentage of work was being outsourced by small, medium, and large companies? And I thought there were some really quite interesting things going on there, which I wish I had done in the end because it, it's so interesting. You can keep going and going. But what you could do is, if you use work outsourced as a filter. You've got to, I suppose, ask yourself two things. What, you've got to ask yourself, what does it mean when work is outsourced? So it's a capacity thing. Is it that you've got too much work, and so you've got to outsource it, which I'm sure some things are, or does it highlight a skills deficit? You can't do it, so you have to pass it out. Yeah? And so you can interrogate that with either of those interpretations in some way. But there are other things that help you, because... Here in large organisations, I got as a percentage of the work, a huge amount of people, relatively huge amount of people, are doing traditionally based, uh, con traditionally produced, non-digital images. Okay, but and what I do know is that in large organisations, the average age of those people working there is 50 years old. Think about the last slide, where who's doing all the traditional work. I can also tell you that in medium organisations, the average age is 13 years younger. And the huge amount of experience, the average amount of experience up here is, is incredibly different from the other two. So when we start applying some of the things we know, we can start perhaps trying to understand what's going on here where perhaps it might be, I don't know, does anyone else have an idea about what might be happening here? Um, as a percentage of the work, it might be in medium organisations who incidentally, on average, have the much bigger graphics teams. They have almost the average size of a, a graphics team in a medium-sized organisation is just under six, uh, six practitioners per team. Yeah. 
for the large organisation. The small organisation is under two. So it's a huge difference there. So as a percentage of the work, this might be telling you that actually they're covering a whole range of work in these medium organisations uh, uh, with big join offices, attracting lots of different types of work. Yeah, does that ring true? So that actually, although that's dropped down, that's not saying they're not doing a lot of it, it's just they're doing a lot of other things as well, yeah? And the fact that they're not outsourcing too much is because they've got capacity to actually do the work. Whereas over here, the small companies where uh, the, the, um, there's one, possibly two illustrators working, a uh, huge amount of by uh, proportion, huge amount of publication work going on, and really, if, if you're going to get any traditional sort of stuff, find you or whatever like that, it's probably going to go into a publication, yeah? And yet they're also bringing in a huge amount of, or outsourcing a lot of work, and there might be a tie in there, and it's something you, one can look at um, with some of, some of the other data we've got. Um, as I said, I just threw this again, and in a sense, I wish I had them, but it was late last night, so I thought, oh, I'm not backing out now. <laughs> and another way of looking at this is perhaps a, a, a different scenario again here with the large organisations. They've got a huge amount of publication work proportionately going through the join office, and yet because they've got all that pool of experience, they can actually handle the work. They can't, oh, they've got the skills to do it, so they're handing out less work. It's not about, they're not handing it out possibly because they've got a skills deficit. It's just they're handing it out because they've probably got too much work. That's what I, I, that suggests to me. So with just these little bits of data, bringing it together and, and uh, the interpretation of it, it, it suggests different scenarios for different work, work environments, whether it's in a medium or large or, or small organisation. And so this can start feeding into pictures of how specialists are working, which I suggest is useful, possibly more useful, for professional representative bodies who uh, like to validate, who like to set standards, best understand, A, how many people are out there, it's useful understanding how many people are out there that they don't know about, because unless they're members, they won't know about them. And it'd be really useful to know, start getting a handle on what the working experience is of their members and non-members, so that when they perhaps come to policy making about where skill shortages lie, they can actually target policy. So, majority of graphic staff I don't want to be negative about this, but I'm just, you, I'm hiding behind the figures here. <laughs> so the majority of graphic staff opted not to join representative bodies. Uh, traditional still slowly ebbing away, and I make this claim that I can support it, digital skills adopted in a largely ad hoc manner, which they are, uh, for, between different studios. I mean, I come from a graphic design background. Uh, when I was working in graphic design, there was an industri industry standard. It was Quark Express when I worked. All the prints were set up for Quark Express. I remember coming into archaeology, into the graphics environment. Nobody used Quark Express. All these different little packages going off to print, the print was blowing because the, the printers were set up for different standards. Yeah, it's a huge problem. And that, I think, still persists. Industry standard. This is sort of culture in archaeology, it seems to me, from being a bit of an outsider that everyone sort of muddles along and does their own thing. A lot of nodding heads. <laughs> okay, so finally, where is the evidence-based regulatory sphere of influence? Right, <laughs> evidence-based, what I'm talking about. Evidence for specialists, meaningful evidence of you know, what people are doing. Regulatory sphere of influence, Professional bodies, professional representative bodies. The people, when you want to join them, will say, I need you to do X, Y, and Z in order to be this sort of member. Who insist that uh, if you're a member, and I think it's good, you do CPD. 
and it's formalised to an extent, and that it's mandatory. That's good. But what sort of CPD? And is there CPD in the graphics? Don't start me on for CPD in the graphics department in the area. Profile in the, uh, profile in the profession will tell you about organisations that provide CPD. They do not tell you where that CPD goes. I can tell you in 2010 exactly where that CPD was going or wasn't going. And in a, probably about a month's time, I'll tell you exactly where it is or isn't going in relation to specialist graphics people. That one? Uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm sorry.